the shooting range. In this episode, the T-64 and friends, how the USSR happened to have three MBTs at the same time, Ernst Heinkel and his Greif, the last chance to get the Nazi gold. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with the new star of War Thunder, the M1 Abrams. Our guest today is a pure legend, a symbol of the modern US ground forces, hero of many conflicts and all that. Meet the M1 Abrams. First of all, let's look at the engine. Apart from being outstandingly loud, it provides as much as 1,519 horsepower, which leads to a maximum of 72 kph. You won't get that fast very often, but even then, in real battle conditions and off-road, you will run at a stable 50 to 55 kph, which is quite nice. Also, this tank is amazing when it comes to reverse, 40 kilometers per hour. Not only can you hide after a shot with that, if you want, you can outrun a T-64, backwards. As for the armor, You've got composite in the front, with protection from kinetic and high explosive shells. For those of you who like the numbers and all that, the lower glacier plate can withstand 380 millimeters of kinetic damage and 600 millimeters of an explosive one. The upper one is less protected, but then again, it's a lot harder to hit it too. The turret is interesting as well. It rotates at a great rate of 40 degrees per second and also is protected from damage by different shells, 400 and 650 millimeters correspondingly. What we mean is, it'll be quite difficult to open up this baby from the front. The protection of the turret is a lot weaker on the sides, 160 and 400 millimeters from different shells, but it's still enough to save most of the crew members in case of a direct hit. By the way, have you noticed the way the ammo racks are stacked? Almost all the ammo is hidden in the back of the turret and there's a layer of armor dividing it from the crew. Why is that? Well, with this design, the Abrams can continue to fight even after somebody lights up its ammo. Thanks to the blow-off panels, you simply extinguish the fire and get back into action. As for the armament, you've got the M68A1 cannon of 105mm and the M774 APFSDS shells piercing up to 410mm from 500m. If you prefer a less conventional approach, you'll also find the M393 Hesh and the M456A2 Heat FS shells also piercing up to 400 millimeters of armor. Yeah, this tank is quite demanding of your aiming skill, but if you miss, you're still okay. The reload rate of this gun is only five seconds. The Abrams is also quite durable, not only because of good armor, but also because this one is completely at home with any kind of smoke screens. It has, uh, well, all of them, and can cover not only itself, but basically the whole team. Now, if, after all that, you still haven't figured it out, on this tank, you can play however you like. Seriously, capturing points, close combat battles, sniper duels, flanking. This tank is as universal as death itself. Okay, if you insist, it isn't very good when it comes to ambushes, but only because of the engine that roars so loud that it's heard from every corner of the map. Still, in all other cases, you'll be unstoppable on this one. And now, a story on how one Soviet MBT suddenly transformed into three.
During the Cold War, the USSR ended up in a very strange situation. They got as much as three MBTs in service with similar performance data but not compatible with each other. Those were the T-64, the T-72 and the T-80. How could this happen in a country with a planned economy? And how did the Bolsheviks not notice that? Well, let's find out. First of all, a couple of words on the T-64. Its predecessors, the T-54 and the T-62, were based on the T-44. But this one was brand new and revolutionary in many ways. From a cooling system and the undercarriage, to armor and an autoloader. During 1968, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union decided that the T-64 had to be assembled in three locations. Kharkov, Leningrad and Nizhny Tagil. At the same time, the tank wasn't very stable. It had a lot of problems, especially in the engine part. So, in Nizhny Tagil, they decided to use another engine, the V-45, descendant of the legendary V-2. One thing led to another, and instead of a modification, they'd introduced a new tank. It was the T-72, with another autoloader, a more traditional cooling system, and a new undercarriage. Now, there were two MBTs in one country, that performed pretty much at the same level, but had different construction. In theory, the T-72 was a cheaper analog, in case of a new war. But, if it was supposed to be cheaper and simpler, why bother installing a new and expensive undercarriage? The thing was, probably, not in its price, but in habits of the military. The T-64 was too modern for them. They had to get used to it and create new infrastructure for it. And then came the more traditional T-72, and sure enough, became quite popular. Okay, what about the T-80? This one is a bit more complicated. The thing was that during 1948 in Leningrad, an engineer named Yusuf Kortin started experimenting on turboshaft engines, trying to fit one into a tank. Usually, they were used in helicopters, and all the first years of work led to nothing. But in 1966, the Soviet government found out that the Americans were creating a turboshaft for their future MBT, the Abrams. Gortin then proposed to install such an engine in the T-64 and was backed up by the future Ministry of Defense, Dmitry Ustinov. As a result, instead of assembling the T-64 in Leningrad, they were developing another new tank, this time with a turboshaft, a new transmission and an undercarriage similar to Western models. And yes, it was named the T-80. And they decided to make this one not only in Leningrad, but also in the Soviet Ukraine. Now, in Kharkiv, they didn't like this idea. They were forced to assemble quite a strange tank with a less than perfect engine when they'd already created and tested their own 1000 horsepower two-stroke diesel engine for the T-64. It was as powerful as the one on the T-80, but a lot more efficient. So, why did they have to install a turboshaft anyway? The engineers stood their ground and won, at least partially. The T-80UD was assembled in Kharkov with their own two-stroke diesel engine. And here's the final question. Why wouldn't they just use the same diesel on the T-64 without wasting seven years on some strange experiments? Well, unfortunately, there are still some questions that we don't have the answers to. And now, let's go to Germany, where Ernst Heinkel was desperately trying to get rich.
They say that Ernst Heinkel hated the Nazis, and they would be completely wrong. He was one of the first to realize how colossal the profit from their war preparations could be, especially uh, the revival of the German Air Force. He quickly set himself a goal to make the words Luftwaffe and Heinkel sound like synonyms. That would clearly make him, Ernst Heinkel, the richest and most powerful aircraft businessman in Europe, and possibly in the whole world. But those plans would always fail. First, he created the Heinkel HE-111. He almost got it right. But then Hitler suddenly wanted all the bombers to be able to dive bomb. Out of nowhere came the team from Junkers, the worst rivals of Heinkel, and presented the U-88 that became the most mass-produced two-engined aircraft of the Luftwaffe. Okay, better luck next time. Heinkel switched to one-engine dive bombers and got outsmarted by Junkers again. Fine, screw the bombers completely. Here's a one-engine fighter for you, Mr. Hitler, the HE-112. And you know who gets in the way this time? No, not Junkers. Willi Messerschmitt himself with his BF-109. Heinkel tried to fight this fight and created the HE-100. But it could only be called a royal fiasco. Ernst Heinkel was constantly out of luck. There was only one area left that he could succeed in, a strategic bomber. Why? Because Goering had already announced Hitler's position on that one. In the coming war, Germany would not need an aircraft like this, so no need creating them. But Heinkel knew. Germany would surely need it, even if it didn't realize it yet. Of course, the projects of all the Ural bombers were closed. But there was a way out. He needed to create an aircraft that was de jour a two-engine bomber. But in reality, the engine on this one wouldn't be typical. It would be a paired power plant also known as the Daimler-Benz 606 and later 610. Now, there would still only be two propellers, so technically it would be a two-engine aircraft. The fact that each propeller was powered by two power plants, well, Hitler didn't need to know this technological boring stuff, right? The problem was, Heinkel wasn't the only smart man in the industry. Messerschmitt has already launched his ME261 Adolfein with the same engine solution. Heinkel needed to hurry, but he couldn't. The HE177, also known as the Greif, turned out to be the most technically complicated aircraft in the history of the German aircraft industry. Its creators had to make a lot of unusual and difficult decisions. They'd even taken out a heavy fire barrier behind the engine mount, just to make the aircraft able to bomb from a flat dive. It was a huge mistake, but at the time, it passed unnoticed. Of course, the Blitzkrieg failed and turned into a war of attrition. Heinkel had finally found his luck. The Luftwaffe generals had realized how much they needed a strategic bomber, and he was the only one with a more or less finished prototype. Now, he was able to dictate his own rules on how a bomber should look. The Luftwaffe could only agree and beg to give it to them as quickly as possible. And Heinkel did for a lot of money, of course. The Greif made it to mass production, even with all of the fire safety equipment lacking, because the Luftwaffe needed anything that could bomb British and Soviet cities and manufacturing. But what could a thousand Greifs do against many thousands of American and British strategic bombers? Those had already turned most of Germany into dust. In his underground bunker in the final days of his life, Hitler finally understood why one needs a strategic bomber. As for Heinkel, he was hastily siphoning his money off to Switzerland and preparing a story on how he hated the Nazis. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline, developers answering questions from the comments.
The first question was asked by a user called Meron Bridge. New jets anytime soon? Great patch, by the way. Oh, and what I like the most out of the new effects is definitely the new water effects. Glad you liked it, mate. As for the new jets, there will definitely be more. Sooner or later, we can't say, but there will be, that's for sure. A player called Members Ship writes, Will we ever be able to make our own ammo belts? Yeah, cause that would totally not ruin the balance like at all. Also, we take a more historical approach here and try to get each machine with exactly the ammo it actually used. Blackman says, Any possibility of more French tanks coming in the next patch? Hey there, this is totally possible. We're not done with the French ground forces in the slightest. Keep your eyes peeled. And the last, very serious message was sent in by a player called Captain Skylynx. What happens when a challenger challenges a challenger to a challenge? Victory! Well, we'd bet on mutual destruction and lots of casualties. These challenges can be quite messy. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.